my father made me keep it right right about here. I I couldn't get it too long. He always <laughs> sent me back to get it a little shorter. You know, give them instructions. You know, for for a while we used to get the bowl cut. I mean, right across the street, this guy would literally take the bowl and and we'd get the oh god, my brother and me would cry. Joey Belladonna. Sounds like he was in one of those Godfather movies or maybe Casino with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, right? But actually, Joey is part Italian-American from his father's side, but he's also part Native American from his mother's side. His given name was Joseph Bellardini. Boy, if that's Italian, wow. Okay, seriously, when I think about iconic thrash metal band Anthrax, I think Joey Belladonna and also my friend, drummer, Charlie Bernardi, of course. And when I say the name Joey Belladonna, people immediately think Anthrax. Now, Joey's presently the dynamic frontman for Anthrax, and his name is definitely etched among, among the legends of rock history. He's known for his wild, energetic stage behavior, his powerful tenor vocal range, and his electrifying performances, which helped propel the band to unprecedented heights of success. Now, Joey is a six-time Grammy Award nominee. His voice has been featured on six studio albums and several LPs that have sold a total of 8 million copies worldwide. But during Belladonna's first tenure with Anthrax, he was voted the number one singer for two years in a row in Metal Forces magazine. Now, Anthrax was a band that helped launch the thrash metal genre in the 1980s, and Joey was there for the classic recordings. Now, throughout his career, he has shared the stage with legends like Iron Maiden, Kiss, Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath, Dio, Public Enemy, Living Color, Primus, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, Alice Cooper, Leonard Skinner, Whitesnake, Slayer, Judas Priest, Slipknot, Motorhead, Lamb of God, Megadeth, Rob Zombie, Kill Switch and Gage, Alice in Chains, Steel Panther, Black Label Society, King's Act, Testament, Overkill, Exodus, Halloween, woo, and many others. Wow. Now, before joining Anthrax in late 1984, Joey was a member of a band called Bible Black, a hard rock band formed by two ex-ELF or ELF rainbow musicians, drummer Gary Driscoll and bassist Craig Gruber. Anthrax was so impressed with Joey's singing and his work with that band, they offered him a job without even having him audition. He was the lead singer of Anthrax from 1984 to 1992 and was considered part of the classic lineup, featuring him, of course, and Dan Spitz, Scott Ian, Frank Bello, and Charlie Benatti. In 1985, the Armed and Dangerous EP was the first Anthrax released to feature Belladonna on vocals. Joey eventually left Anthrax in 1992 and was replaced by John Bush but returned for the 2005 Classic Lineup Reunion Tour. Now, when Joey left Anthrax in 1992, he formed a new band called Belladonna, and the band has released three studio albums. Now, check this out. When he's not on tour with Anthrax, Belladonna plays drums and sings in a classic rock cover band called Chief Bigway. And recently, in, in 2022, he launched a new Journey tribute band called Beyond Frontiers. I'm telling you, man, when Joey told me about this Journey cover band, I was blown away because I'm thinking, the lead singer from Anthrax can sing like Steve Perry? I mean, those vocal styles couldn't be more further apart, but that's what's amazing. Uh, anyway, Joey is a super cool dude to hang with. I love the guy. He's kind. He's humble. He's a wonderful man. And that's a big reason why I asked him to be part of my podcast, The Kenny Arnoff Sessions. And I also love the fact that he plays ice hockey in the winter. I love that. Joey, how are you, buddy? Did I leave anything out? What's going on, man? I got the we memo, started... right? Yeah. Oh, God. Don't... You see, you got hair, so it looks great. Man, that looks, those are perfect. I had to do it. I... There's a... There's a fellow in New York City that sends some glasses to us, and he uh, he's done quite quite the famous people. And these are pretty pretty gnarly glasses, but obviously they're oh. made of. His name is Moss. 
What's his last? He got the hair. Lepoe, Moss Lepoe. He's he's he does all the stuff by hand. He's he's good. Really? You got to hook me up. These are Tom Ford. These are, I love these things, but I'm always looking for glasses. You know why? Because I lose them. I'm always losing. There's a lot of people out there that got some very expensive designer glasses that I left on the airplane or in the hotel room or a taxi cab or an Uber or whatever. Do you get them back? Is it people nice enough to return them? Nah, nah. So, dude, you you live, you grew up in Oswego, New York, right? Is that like near Syracuse? And you're still up there, right? Ah, uh, yeah, I was from Oswego, New York. Yeah, we lived uh, 28 years there. Wow, that's incredible. How close is that to Syracuse? That's about 50 minutes drive north, and uh, small, small town, small, small, five thousand probably, from what I remember. Do you grow that Kenny corn that? Did explain or Casey, your wife, did she come up with Kenny corn? To the- oh, I'll bring it, Christopher. Now, which yeah, is okay. which is a, a, a total goofy thing. Uh, All right, oh, good glasses. Now, did I come up with another Kenny pair? Corn or did you? That's another pair of Moss's glasses. <laughs> Hi, Kenny. <laughs> Tell me the whole thing. Did I come up with Kenny corn or did you? Well, we you, we are at the Ronnie James Dio live stream, and it's the first time we had met you. So yeah. we were just going over where you're from and everything. And I said, I was from Kansas City. And you go, oh, Kansas, no, Missouri. But that led into you've been there and you've driven through Kansas. And I said, yeah, well, you know, kind of you fall asleep, wake up in Wichita, fall asleep, wake up your state line. And you, <laughs> yeah, I said, it's just all corn. And you go, well, corn's never killed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that led into so, some pictures arriving onto your phone from mine of me in a corn maze, freaking out, right? So that led to then you finding cornfields and sending us videos. And so, you know, every now and then these things just kind of pop up. Well, listen, Joey, I, I, people are going to want to know, I mean, like how, I mean, you're this, you know, obviously you had this tremendous success as the front man, you know, from Anthrax, but. I mean, you're a little kid. You how did you get from being the little kid and becoming, you know, this singer Joey Belladonna? I mean, what inspired you? You know, how did you get to where you are? I mean, what was the journey? Well, I've always played drums, and then Ooh. I, play, I was a drummer, and I love playing drums. And we'd always have parties, and eventually, you put the bands together and you start rehearsing. And next thing you know, and then all of a sudden I say, you know what? Nobody else sings. I can sing. So I sang and played drums from, from almost right right out the box. So I've always done that for quite some time. I, and I still do occasionally, you know. Uh, in Anthrax, I don't, I don't go even sit on the kit. I don't go near it. But I have always played drums and sang. So that's kind of what I did. And, of course, I sit at home and practice uh, to any record that I could sing to. I, you know, I was singing stuff like early days from the Beatles right on to Yes and Kansas and, you know, anything I could do. Like, I'm leaving hundreds of bands out. Yeah. Just, you know, whatever. Well, obviously, you did Led Zeppelin, I bet. Oh, yeah, Zeppelin, The Who, Foreigner, Journey, White Snake. Oh, God, I, I, Bad Company. I mean, there's just a whole array of band. Deep Purple, I was a big Deep Purple. You know, I love a lot of classic, good hard rock, too. You know, I was very much into melodic music. So it, it it, it was always, it's still with me. I'm still doing it. I go out by myself with my tracks and I'll do four hours with all my recorded stuff and I'll just sing hundreds of songs because I love that kind of, I mean, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Jeff Tall. I mean, I could go Van Halen. I could go all over the map and I love just doing it because it's a lot of fun. It's challenging too. No kidding. I, can't, I mean, it's hard enough for me to play drums on the, all those different artists you're talking about. I mean, I can't even tell me you are not playing drums and singing Burn by Deep Purple. I mean, if you, I mean, playing Burn on the drums is hard enough with all those fills. Uh, If you can sing that song and play the drums on that song at the same time, that's sick. Or Van Halen, for that matter. Tom Sawyer did that, sang, did Limelight, Closer closer to Heart. Uh, I know he just did a lot of, a lot of cool stuff, you know. Uh, I didn't go too far over my head. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm decent, but I'm, I'm, a, I stay in my lane, you know, I mean, even though the rush stuff, 
I didn't sit around for days trying to get every lick. I mean, I got, it was pretty close, close enough, you know, enough to have a little bit of room to jam and not get too locked down because you want to learn as many songs as we could. So, but a lot of it's pretty cl- is closer than not close. I'll be honest. Joe, th- that's insane, dude. I mean, come on, that, that you're a talented mofo. To be able to play, sing and play the drums on Tom Sawyer, or even, uh, <laughs> that's incredible. I'm, I'm blown away. So you realized you could sing right away. How old were you when you, you know, you had your first band and you're singing and playing drums? High school graduation, talking what, 76, 75? Wait a minute, geez, maybe, maybe even talking, I don't know. Well, seven, you, three, you were four. 18, you're 18 years old. Yeah, I mean, even younger than that. I, I'm, I'm probably more talking early, picking up the vocal drumming thing by myself without really having any kind of band thing probably around 15 16 you know to be honest without you know being really such a beginner which no one would ever hear you but your mom and dad you know but they were good too parents were always letting us rehearse i mean i my father put an extra speaker into the tv so we could play as loud as we wanted and i'd have to go up and tell them we're done because you know we start and stop a lot you know so it was it was good you know that is so cool. So they were like super supportive of of the whole thing. You would have band practice in your house, like in the the, the living room or the uh, family room, right? Yeah, and we had a lot of equipment too. I mean, we had two SBT heads, four four fifteenths, <laughs> two Marshall stacks, and no PA. I would sing over it, and we were, we were having a good time. I never even know the PA till like years ago. You know, I never had a PA. That's sick. To say out loud. You and Sammy Hagar, man, can blow out. I did Axis TV right here with him featuring Steve Lukather. I said, you, uh, uh, you know, I got some monitors. He says, oh, I don't need no monitors. I just need to hear the guitar. And I'm like, what? One take, flawless in tune. You guys blow me away. That's, you know, I love the fact that your parents supported you because that's a big difference, man. You don't know how important that is when you're there. I had the same parents, you know. We we took over every the dining room, the living room, uh, the family room. But you just think that's normal. But that propels us. You don't have to worry about you not having support or your parents like Dee Snyder's dad was a state trooper. He was not exactly into his son putting makeup on and doing Twisted Sister. But you and I didn't have that problem. We had all that support. Makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, there is times later on, their fathers that maybe you're playing the same places. You're not. Maybe you ought to get a job and do something. I said I never let them persuade me to that. You know, <laughs> working at the steam plant or something. You know, with Nagar Mohawk, which was a power plant. I'd be a guard there. I said I'm just not going to do that. I'll, t- I'll I'll listen to you, but you know. And then of course, when Anthrax came around, obviously he got it. He still didn't really understand me singing wise because I don't hear you. They don't turn you up loud enough or you know, <laughs> I don't understand you. But, he, you know, he, he got it when everybody started to catch on to the music. But they were very supportive. I have to tell you, they were. That's huge. Yeah. Well, kid, you remember your first band, what the name of it was? We had, I had a band really, the one in seventh, eighth grade. I don't even know if we had a name. I know I had twin brothers that were in the band, but. The first band, Gibraltar, was really my first high school dance band. You know, we would get the gigs and we were doing like, you know, Montrose and Aerosmith and the tubes and weird Mm. stuff that you couldn't even dance to. But we were like, you know, I had the dry ice. I had the boom stand, you know, which now the headset is the best. I mean, that that's the best thing I ever could get is a, a headset. I like that broom stand when it comes over your head. Oh, yeah, man. That, is that a, with the gooseneck. You sing up like that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. The Just dry ice. It around. Oh, yeah. The dry ice would come out of the can in the back and then shock me because it would be getting water and stuff. And Oh, yeah. That was fun trying to break the dry, the dry ice out, out in the yard with a big <laughs> uh, bed sheet cracking against the wall. So it's, we went all we went all out, man. We had a lot of fun. Well, I, that's you guys would probably always book steady. I mean, you know, that that's you bring in the big stage to the small little venues. People love that. Your father made me lights. He did. The, he made me a drum oh, set. Oh man! They made me what? a clear drum set. Yeah, I mean, I actually we bought all the lugs and I had my own clear drum set that was homemade. 
You know, I don't know where it is now, but you know, I'm always selling and buying things. You know, that's another thing. Yeah. Do not buy any more symbols. You got enough stuff enough already because yeah but i got there's different ones i gotta have this one for that and this one that you know how it is it's like it's never ending i love it I, I, man your dad was sounds amazing he was so supportive what what were you what were your parents listening to like when you were a little kid on the, the turntable that would have maybe influenced you you know like what was their music i don't think we had a lot of music at all playing at the house to be honest with you i know my right. father well i'll tell you the truth my mom she, i made her tapes of like barbara streisand engelbert humperdinck tom jones like that and then my father you know the 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 classic stuff like you know sinatra but not a lot of music there really wasn't it wasn't well you know italian american you like sinatra you know back yeah. then hell i even did a, a trip i did a with Bob Kulik, we did a tribute to uh, Sinatra. We kind of roughed up uh, Strangers in the Night. Wow. So that's out. Wow. That was interesting. I would have liked to do it traditional, but they wanted to do it heavier. So we did it. Right. Of course, that's why they, they brought you in. My sister was the big the big one for music. She was next door to my room. And she had all the cool albums. You know, the Crosby, Stills, and Nash, the, all, the, all the deeper cut stuff that I did, wasn't really new to. Like her friend brought over me uh get your wings he goes I, I don't know who these are i don't like this you want this you know things like that and they'd have parties and i would listen to all their music too so it, it gave me a little bit of up up uh and what's going on too what everyone else was listening to it at an older age you know oh so she how how much older was she from you she wasn't very much older than me actually probably like three years older that's but, but, but when you're a kid that's a whole nother world so she was listening to what was on the radio and it was changing so fast that that's a that'll, that'll influence you you know yeah it was cool to be able to go in there and just grab what i wanted and listen to or listen to what she was listening to so anthrax was a generation like defining band in the late 80s while metal style music was peaking i mean did you feel like at the time like oh my god we're in this cutting edge new thing you know that we're we're charting waters that Nobody else has done. I mean, did it did it feel like you were part of this new movement or were you just doing your thing? I always say when I got a call to fly out to check out this band, when my father called us. I was in this cover band for a little while while Bible Black was kind of really not doing anything. And just to show up and see four guys from New York City playing this hard, heavier stuff, even though I listened to Maiden and Priest and stuff, but this was different, you know, and then plus I hadn't really heard myself really sing full in a capacity where like I had to do something completely different. And all of a sudden there's this originality from that band and myself formed this kind of cool thing with a little tenor vocal, with some fast some speed, some, you know, it just was cool uh, the way it went down. And I don't think of it any other way, but I had no idea what I was dealing with, you know, musically, because I hadn't heard it before and I didn't know the people. Well, they obviously had checked you out. They found you, you know, like you said, I mean, they found you and they wanted you there. That's incredible. And you weren't singing like that style. No, no, right. Not at all. I was doing, you know, all classic rock at the time. You know, the Bible black was a blues kind of Sabbathy, deep purple stuff, but we really never got our feet on the ground. Everybody was just, really at the last bit of their wanting to do it. It almost was like, wow, it was kind of a shame, you know, that we never really got to get doing something for real. But at the same time, it afforded me just to, to move on and, and see something else. And then that's where my name from that band come, come to a, a possibility for them to have someone come in without really having to search around and do a cattle call, which I don't know if they did that I know of. And and I walked in in it, and they asked right away if you would be interested in stick around and and do some more, and you know, and it just kind of led to what it did. I had no idea. In fact, I wasn't sure what we were going to be. Uh, there was just no way to tell. So, but when you got in the band, and and I'm curious, what's what, what's the process of the way Anthrax writes songs? Does everybody contribute, or is it a, a few guys are doing it, and and also? because you can sing the way you can sing, did that affect the way they wrote or you guys wrote those songs? 
they're always jamming together instrumentally. I think they've probably been doing that from day one. That's kind of the process, really. Everybody, they get in the room and do their thing, you know, and they scrape around and get everything, the best ideas, you know, the more intricate, but yet very catchy enough, but still be true to the style. There's always that involved. So there's a lot of nitpicking, I'm sure. I'm not there for a lot of it. Now, that's just what they how they do it. It's a different way of doing it. Uh, I mean, I don't sit around and go, okay, let's go from this transition to this, but give me a minute to come in. No, or we're going right in. Or like, there's a lot of words, you know, there's a lot of, I don't get a key change. I don't, or I actually don't even pick the key. You know, some people are like, hey, we're, wow. we're doing this in E. Let's wow. get up. This is, I just go in and sing whatever's handed to me. And it's kind of cool because I'll do it on the next album. You know, you'll just go in there. And we'll start printing out some words and we'll start messing around with it. Before you know it, at the end of the day, I got a whole tune that I've never even sang before. And it's kind of just spontaneous. And I kind of like it because it's it's kind of a miracle in a way because I just walk out of that booth by the time it's dinner. And we don't go very late anymore. Usually you just go till 12 or 10 in the morning till midnight and you're burnt out just singing over and over and over and not really because we never organized. Now we're organizing stuff so properly enough that we just get to what we got to get to and really focus on a good good tone, a, a good uh, vibe. And, and a lot of the ideas are right there when I start singing because you can really, really start to hear it take shape. And I try for everything I can get. I go for the mustard of everything. And plus, I, I like to get a hook somewhere. I'm always looking for hooks and I'm always doing the harmonies alongside it really, really fast. Because I like to see where they're going to go, if they're going to fit at these spots. And we'll say, okay, we'll come back to that. But I'm always testing it as I go along to see where I can get stuff and where it's not going to work, you know, just because I feel like it, you know, so you get anxious to try everything really fast. Oh, yeah, man. It's like, you know, you're, you're a guy who likes to score touchdowns. You know, you want to make goals. You want to score and you're right in it. You know, it's, that's, I, when I did, I had a, I was part of a band. It was Tony Iommi from Sabbath, Glenn Hughes playing bass and singing in me. And I went to out to Wales and Monmouth and we recorded. I never heard the vocals or even knew what the vocals were till the album came out. I had never done that before, but it worked because Tony Iommi, you know, like, like Jimmy Page, everything he plays is a hook line. And I remember there was one song, it was like three movements, you know, three completely different movements. And I was just blown away that, that, that Glenn put these incredible vocals on as if that had been the first thing. So that was my, the first time I remember making a record or, or, or involved with being part of a thing where the, the vocals came on after the fact. But obviously you, you're used to that. And that's, but what blew me away was... <laughs> You didn't pick the keys. I mean, you'd think, oh, they'd go, like, is this okay? I know right away when stuff's going to be, okay, this one's up there, you know, because <laughs> it's just written. And and not to mention that there's no room to to pause in between because there's a lot of overlapping. I mean, a lot. I mean, it's it's really challenging at times. I mean, nowadays, there's a lot, a lot more room than before. But at the same time, it, it's still challenging because it's moving. You know, it's it's really moving. And in some of the words are not easy to pronounce. The the enunciations of some things are not as fluent as it would be if, you know, if you said, yeah, okay, all right. You know, it's not easy. Some of it's very, very tricky how you say it. And I, I always loved records. I didn't know what they were saying half the time anyhow, but I always try to pronounce it the best I can. Do you write the lyrics or do they write the no, lyrics? No, Scott, okay. Scott likes to do a lot of it. He's He's been doing it for quite some time. Uh, and that's just what he likes to do. You know, it's like Bernie. It's like me. And El he's he's Bernie and I'm Elton John. I, I sing the stuff after he hands it to me. But he likes doing it. But, you know, I, I personally would love to be you know part of all that stuff. But I think what I do in the studio and how much I give to these songs and how much ideas that Jay Rustin lately, uh, the producer, we're constantly making sure we can get everything we can get out of a song. So we're always going back and forth. But very little banter and we just get to it. So whatever works, really, there's no, I mean, yeah, it would be great to sit in a room for, for months and jam on a mic, 
like a PA in a basement, like we used to do, and you would just pound away at stuff and go, wow, I didn't know you could sing something like that over that. That is really cool. Wait, do that again. See, that stuff isn't there. But I don't think we're missing anything, but you'll never know. Well, you never know. It might be, it might end up being that, that uh, you try doing it that way, you know, at some point. So let me ask you this. So with you guys being, you know, very successful, and there were other bands like Metallica and Megadeth and Slayer, were you guys like pals or was there a competition with everybody like, trying to everybody trying to compete because i mean it's only natural i mean when i was with Mellencamp, we were trying to be number one so we might like this other band but you know they were kind of we we're all competing for that spot was there any of that in the, in your world i'll speak for myself i i just really focused on being as good and great whatever you want to call it i i didn't i if anything i would love to be friends and be, have a camaraderie with that I know there's uh, a lot of, should I say, uh, inspiration and uh, a lot of uh, excitement to try to be the best, right? We all want to be on top. But I, I don't think we chase, I don't chase that. I can't. I, I Just do what you do and let the fans take that wherever they want to take it. This is why I like you. I like you because you're a good person. That's cool. From your heart. That's good. That's great. Yeah. My dad always used to say, you know, I'd go, well, yeah, but, 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 you know, but, but that guy, he said, just focus on what you're doing. Do a great job. Don't worry about that other stuff. But, you know, when you're a little kid, you know. So, I mean, I'm a twin. So, <laughs> when did, were your twins, were they competitive? Like, always trying to, like, up each other because they were, like, the same. What, are they identical? You're, you're, you're... My, my guys that I played with a long yeah. time ago? Yeah. Oh, they were the funniest guys, man. I loved being around. They lived three houses down from me. And one used to play the guitar. And the other guy, they both would sing. And it was just, it was amazing. Yeah, they were very competitive. You know, almost, I could just about tell them apart. They were really close. <laughs> they were just a riot. They're great at sports. Really good at sports. That's the way me and my brother were. We both three Letterman jocks by the time we were a sophomore in high school. We play right behind each other. He'd be on the offensive line in soccer. I'd be a halfback right behind him. And we all had long hair when I had hair. But it was right because they get through him and they get to me and go, what? There's two of you. And then Johnny would come, my brother would come back around and it just throw them off. And it sounds like the twins, I guess they're not your brothers. They were just friends. But they, they that's, yeah, that's exactly the way it was with me and my brother. Competitive, funny. Uh, played sports, played music, the whole thing. And their mother hated them practicing with me. They, she did not want them over there. And she's like, you guys are going over there again. I don't want you over there. It's like, oh my God, this is, it's not working, but I love you guys. We're going to always hang and we do stuff together, but it just isn't, you know, it was a drag. I felt bad for them. You know? How has metal music changed since like when you were really, it was coming on, you know, Anthrax came on, the thrash metal thing was like this new movement. How do you think it's changed now? I mean, has it evolved? I mean, what, what's 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 your feeling on that? Well, there's there's a lot of things that are going on. I mean, obviously, there's all the production is enormously different. You know, all the Pro Tools and, you know, we're not dealing with the tapes. We used to slave the drums and another, put those away and bring them back. You know, all that whole tape thing was, it was awesome to have it. And I still think the people still use it. And that's great. That's a big difference, right? And, you know, the hours spent uh, trying to get people in the in the same building where you can do it remotely. We got that going on, which is awesome, too. It can be nice. I really love still being in the room. But like me today, you and I could record. You can we could keep sending us up back and forth. We didn't have that. We barely had a, a, a damn cassette to put the idea down, you know. So, I mean, obviously, those are seem small, but they're big. You know, of course, the the album's. Now with the CDs, you don't have all that stuff. Now we're online and that's a whole nother department. But music trend style, I still think it all has a way of mixing together. And it's really hard to put these guys in this category, this band in that category. I hate trying to figure that out. Like, do you ever have like iTunes give you like, here's, I think you can listen. You'll like these guys. They're a lot like what you just listened to. Sometimes they get that. Sometimes they don't. And, you know, it's nice to explore with different sounds. Actually, the vocals have changed. I think some there's a lot more of a, a growl, uh, a hard-nosed 
stuff, even though there was uh, what black metal or whatever. I don't, I, I don't even know the, the names of half of it. Anyhow, I didn't pay attention to too much of it, but th that was there. But now it's even more so it's even more common to have a lot more. And I just don't know how to do it. I don't dislike it. I, I couldn't begin to try it. Well, it's like any music genre. I mean, you're, everybody's trying to do the next thing, you know? As a matter of fact, I mean, if you think about it, if you look at every Led Zeppelin record or every Beatle record, they were always out doing themselves or trying to go to the next thing. And you, and you have to do that in music or any business, really, because you're trying to stay relevant. And it takes creative ideas to come up with new ideas that take your audience to the next place, but you don't want to lose your audience because if it's too radical, then they might go like, whoa, what are you now? So even within one band, we're, you know, we're trying to keep the ball rolling and keep doing new, creative, innovative things to stay relevant. Uh, but then the band start, because I remember when I was with Mellencamp, because I was with him for 17 years, we were like, oh my God, did you hear what Tom Petty did on that record? What is that? You know, and then, then even if we don't do exactly what they did, the idea was to do something that's just as unique in our music like it was in their music. So it's like we're always constantly pushing each other. I'll speak for Anthers for myself. I think we just have a lot of great uh, spontaneous thinking and influences and capabilities of doing a whole lot of cool stuff on a record and keeping it real and the same but at the same time we have a lot of expectations that we can reach higher goals you know i know this seems a bit theory wise but it's there's a lot there and i think we really and that's why we take i would think we take a little longer than less because we want to make sure that we feel good the band feels good about the music versus is it right or is it wrong we just you know you'll know you know when you hear it so because of technology, you know, we got Pro Tools and all this stuff. Uh, that has probably affected, you know, the way you guys record now. It used to be we'd all have to be in the room, have to have tape going. And now we got Pro Tools. And, you know, during the pandemic, I made Joe Satriani's record here in my room by myself because we couldn't be together. So how did you guys adapt to that stuff? Have you adapted by, and done things differently because of technology? Well, I, I still think that uh, getting in the room is still mandatory for uh, those guys to, to really get a writing session. You know, they did it prior before COVID, you know, obviously in the in the past, that's what they would do. Get in the room and just ram, you know, ram it down for a while. And they're still doing it. And uh, but at the same time, like, say, I don't just say Charlie was on the road doing something. He go, hey, you know what? I like that. But check this out. I want to put that on this right now. He could do it from wherever he is, drop it in and it's on there, you know, or somebody can't make it or, you know, you save money too in, in ways that we couldn't do before because everybody was there at all once. Uh, it wasn't always necessary, but now you could just mail it in if you wanted to. But there's definitely a thing about being in the room where you can really have to banter and figure stuff out on the spot, you know, but uh, I, I enjoy both. I, I love being in the studio. There's nothing like, you know, with the whole setup and everything. While when I'm home, obviously I can do it when I feel like doing it or do it as many times as I want with anybody saying, hey, you're wrong or whatever. You just try it and try it. I'll, I, like when I do the journey stuff here and send it back and forth to the guys, God, I could do it 10 times in, in one shot, send it. It's like, oh, all right, I'll do it another 10 times or whatever, or maybe two and I'm good. But I miss the old days too. You know, there was a lot of good times, man. Yeah, I like being in the in the room with everybody too. But like you said, hey man, to be able to do it in my studio like this is incredible. And I can do multiple takes and I end up coming up with things that I would not normally have. So yeah, I mean that that's what's so cool about the technology. Um so uh you guys are out on the road now. Again, it has it changed i mean since the pandemic and everything now you're out i mean what's different now in 2023 for you guys well i i think we learn all kinds of new ways to to travel uh you know how to how to you know find the day uh proper enough for you 
personally, you know, whether it be your phone, you know, whether you want to just chill doing something, you know, everybody has like new ways of getting it done uh, for a length of time. You know, you've been out for a long time, you know, you take five, six weeks out and, you know, you just try your best to make make things as comfortable and uh, and productive as you possibly can. I try to enjoy myself. Chris and I will enjoy ourselves to the max. You know, even when there's a lot of things going down that maybe not be favorable, just you really, really just push and push, man, because nobody cares at the end of the day. As long as you don't, if you bring it, that's all that matters. But there's a lot going on. Uh, travel, too. I mean, we finally had our first uh, double-decker bus. In the States, you know, in Europe, we had them. But this year, last year, man, it was amazing having the bus like that. Everybody can go on one bus. And I like the double-deckers, you know? When you have a good bus, it makes a difference. Because I, I, I love getting in a bus that's got a comfortable bunk, and you can just create your own world. I love it. I, I just, it's, we would travel through the night. It was great. <laughs> Sleep is good, right? A lot of good, if you can get some sleep, if you can get any sleep. Oh my God, really have, I'm a right? horrible sleeper. I sleep like three hours, wake up, go back to sleep, wake up, go back to sleep, wake up, go back to sleep, wake up, because I'm so hyper. But I try to, if I add it all up and I get seven or eight hours, I'm rocking. How about you? Are you good with sleep? I'm with you on that. Some days I, man, I, I could pound it, but I try to stay up too late because once it gets too late, then I really fall into a, a kind of a stupor somehow. I try not to do the naps too. The naps mess me right up. I could be uh, totally fogged. Oh, if I if I slept too long, maybe lay down for a little while if I had to, but I try not to nap because that'll take me right out. But I think the bunks, you know, while we're riding, you get that motion, it kind of puts me to sleep. Where do you like to have your bunk? In the middle, at the front, or the back? And do you like to be on the bottom or the top? Because everybody's got their weird preference. Back passenger side, up top. I like I like being up top. But not when I had vertigo. I had that for six no, days. That Ever sounds vertigo? horrible. Un, un, unbelievable. It's I, I actually sang with vertigo. I woke up one morning. I couldn't even get out of the bus. I was stuck in my bunk. And I and I and the bus was flipping. And I had to call somebody because I said I can't get out of my bunk. I'm, I was petrified and I sang through it. And it was really weird to be able to try to get through the night without really moving too far. And it's a really radical thing to have vertical. How did you even keep your balance? I hear that, you know, when you get vertical, I mean, you can't. Oh, it was hard, man. Stuff was shifting and you get real sick, man. I tried to get sick. I slept straight up in the back of the bus for days because I couldn't lay, there's no way I could lay down or I would be, I would be, oh my God, it'd be unbelievable. It would be like being on a Ferris wheel with no, no stopping. Wow. That, you know, I don't know where that comes from. Isn't it the crystals in your ear or something? That... Yeah. Something in the air. Yeah. Right. Weird. Yeah. And you try to, you turn to the side, there's these things and yeah, man, I just would just, Get sick, 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 and it's like enough already. I got, I got to just, you know, got to get through it here. How'd you get over it? How'd you get past it? You just go away? Yeah, yeah just eventually you, you finally start to get out of it, you know. But you really feel just awful, you know. You're really just sluggish and and just kind of delirious and in your own way because it's just like a constant headache too, you know. But but I, you know. I, you know, I've had the flus too. I've had, you know, I've, I've been on, you know, I remember Oz, when we were out with Ozzy, he even had a, we both had like the flu. You just go out there, you do it and you run back to your bunk and, you know, you sweat it out and do what you can, but only canceled the second time. The first time was a nasal infection. The second time was COVID, you know, and that, what are you going to do? You know, it just, it took you from here to here, both, you know, I got through it. But it was, it, man, it just seized me right up. That's the way I've always been. You know, you know, it's that type of thing. I remember once being on tour in Europe and I had, right before I went on stage, all of a sudden I got the flu and I was puking and crap in my pants. And you go on stage, you get through it, and then you go back to puking and crapping in your pants. But, you know, what are you going to do? 
You know? Yeah, somehow you get through it, right? Yeah, somehow you get through it. That's yeah, that's a incredible survivor stuff. So wait, you gotta tell me about this hockey stuff, dude. I mean, are you why do I think are you a goalie in hockey? Are you the goalie? Yeah. I thought it was a girl. Did you have long hair back then and you were the goalie with long hair? My father made me keep it right right about here. I, I couldn't get it too long. He always used to send me back to <laughs> yeah. get it a little shorter, you know, give them <laughs> yeah. instructions, you know. For, for a while, we used to get the bowl cut. I mean, right across the street, this guy would literally take the bowl and, and we'd get the, oh, God, my brother and me would cry. But, yeah, hockey was great. I loved it. I I. I did all four years. I was like the the DJ on the bus. I I I carried the beer in my goalie bag for our tournaments. I, you know, filled the tub up, you know, with a couple of cases because I had a lot of room in my bag. But no, we we had a great time. I went to hockey school at St. Lawrence. I I just didn't see the next move. The the next move going into like semi pro kind of thing. College just didn't compute to me. It really wasn't my bag, you know. Oh uh, yeah, here's here's my mask. Wow, <laughs> wow, impressive, impressive. Wow, didn't did, did, didn't they come after you? I mean, wasn't any colleges going like, "Whoa, we want this guy. We got to have this guy." I made the All Stars in high school, and I actually trained and went to hockey school in St. Lawrence, which were a lot of the Canadians of Montreal in that area. Wow, and Plattsburgh wow. and stuff, or St. Lawrence, should I say? I, you know, it, it, it might have taken a while just to reach the next. You know, oh, there's the A farm team, that all that kind of stuff. Who knew, you know, that I was going to be able to get far enough. So I just didn't want to take the shot. I had a, a Olympic uh, coach who was goalie for the Olympic team. And he also helped some of the uh, hockey team to win the, uh, the, the Stanley Cup. He let me use his glove the whole time. You know, some really great moments. I had a blast. I, I loved it. I'm so happy that I made the team and got to start. It was a, a hell of accomplishment because everybody was older than me being a freshman, you know. You must have been a bad mofo if, if the Canadians are digging you because they own hockey. And that's that's huge. I mean, and what a position. I mean, goalie. I mean, in hockey. I, mean, that's, I got MVP that, that year out there, too. I think that sports really contributed to my discipline. And, and you know, like, you know, if you can be – Playing, uh, like, say, hockey or football, or in my case, lacrosse, soccer. And, I mean, you, in music or whatever else you do, you, you know what it's like to never give up. That's probably how you were, be, you were able to sing when you had vertigo, because you knew you were in the trenches in high school. You, you, you can't give up. You have, to, you have to fight all the way to the end. Don't you think that helped in your entire life, all, everything you learned with that discipline and fortitude and pushing forward in sports yeah i i you know practicing early in the morning in the cold you know we had the rinks where the it was open semi open all over you know I had to, my mother had to drive me there every morning to rehearse to practice you know i mean and it, yeah it was very very high-ended same i did soccer for four years too i played soccer what? pretty hardcore yeah i was big time into soccer yeah big time what position i i played goal and i played right wing Wow, so you must have been fast. A lot of running. Oh, dude. A lot of running. I know. Dude. You played soccer, too? Yep, did it all the way. As a matter of fact, my brother, my twin, played in the semi-pro league, and when I got out of college, I took his place, because we're identical, because he wanted to go see his girlfriend up in Vermont. I took his place, and that was a game I got creamed, and eventually, a year later, had surgery. They took the, the, the medial meniscus cartilage out of my knee. But yeah, I mean, we, I was playing all the way up until I was 23, until that happened. And I went, you know what? Does that bother you now? That nah, you I'm all right. You know, I went to, a, I went to like the Lakers doctor and I said, what do you, what do you think? I'm bow legged. Do I need surgery? He said, well, how much medicine, uh, how much painkiller you take? He says, I don't take nothing. He says, get out of here. He says, you need surgery. <laughs> He said, you'll need surgery when you, <laughs> when you're taking, you know, Advil all day long. He says, get out of here. Yeah, but my knees are a little bowling. He says, get out of here. <laughs> well, all of them are tough sports. I know football guys thought the soccer guys were wimps. And right. Wimps and, but we really, really, it was a lot of work, man, running around. I know it wasn't hard pounding, you know, like this, but. Oh, dude. Well, I was, I was like Western Massachusetts high scorer attackman in lacrosse. 
And we, uh, and most of the guys on the team were football players. It was me, my brother, and all these football players. My brother broke, blew his knee out the first game, and all of a sudden I became Wayne Gretzky. And, and, and I'd look at my, my coach, and he'd say, nah, run and gun. You know, 50 shots on goal, five are going in. All these other teams, their whole thing was, get that long-haired hippie guy, let's break his bones, and then we can slaughter these guys. And so I had to wear a football girdle and extra pads, and I was, I was, I was ruthless out there. I would just run over people. You have to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool, right? man. I didn't, I love it that you were into sports. And of course, KC, she's a football girl because of Kansas City Chiefs, right? See, we brought the we brought the pom poms. You want us, you asked for pom poms today, so we got <laughs> we got the pom pom. What a great city to come from with regard to football. I mean, come on. So I'm what I'm saying is, you're a football. You must like KC. You have to now, right? I oh, Vikings, man. I love the Vikings. I follow them. I follow them all. I've been a Vikings fan since Joe Cap. What about the Bills? I follow the Bills. I did the anthem there two, three times already. I love that. Oh, I got to find that on you. I'm finding that. I want to see you do the anthem. I mean, you got this hair. I mean, I, I'm Kenny hair on Noff, hair on gone off. And you got this hair. I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, but you're you, man. You're the man. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, the, I'm the opposite of you in that regard. All right. So, so you've played with everybody. Is there one like defining experience? I hate when people ask me this because I'm like, I don't know where to begin, but is there like a, just a mind blowing story or something on the road or on stage that just goes, wow, that was the stuff. Being able to do Yankee stadium for the guys too, especially living in New York city. I mean, who would ever think that the big four and us anthrax would actually be at the, at the, you know, or the garden, we did the garden. We brought public enemy and primus there, you know, or, and, and uh, it's just, you know, I mean, there's that, and then there's, you know, with Slayer, of course, and then Donington, mainly really one of my favorite times is running, uh, getting to hang with Dio again, and for sound check, nobody was there, it was just us and the bands, he sound checked, and we sound checked, and we got to sit, talk for a little bit after, it's just, you know, and of course, you and I, we both did the, the Dio, which we talked about earlier, the, the, that was awesome. That whole live stream. Yeah. I had such a good time. Uh, it was spur of the moment, but Ronnie was one of my favorites, you know, and Maiden too, uh, being on their plane, flying with them, the whole South America run, having Bruce fly it. I mean, how do you, how do you top that? You know, having your gear on there, you get on the plane. It's just so, so amazing to be out. I mean, we did so many runs with those guys. You know, the thing is amazing. What I love about these stories, because no, there's never just one experience. And of course, like Madison Square Garden, come on. But um, is that you think about, you know, when you were saying you're practicing in your living room with that extra speaker and the TV, you know, you got all this equipment there. Your dad's like totally supporting you. If you had thought you would be on, you know, you know, at, at Shea Stadium or at Madison Square Garden, or, you know, on the plane with Bruce flying, I mean, you wouldn't have believed it. but. You did it. You've done it. It's incredible. And I mean, so, I mean, is there like, um, I mean, how would you like to be remembered? I mean, what's your legacy? Do you want to be thought of as what? What is your, you know, the contribution that you've made? What is, do you have a deep passion? Like, you know, you know, I hope that people think, or I hope I'm remembered as, do you have anything like that in your thoughts? I mean, for myself, it's just a lot of hard work. Uh, focus and having originality uh, and actually being able to uh, achieve as much perfection and, and, and have at least the grace of being able to do it and stay with everyone that's doing it and the top level. And even though our music is so uh, kind of, we're in this ball of metal, which to me, I have a lot more variety than, than really meets what I deliver with anthrax because I have a lot, a lot to offer, which a lot of times I can't really give you all of it on that, that style. It just doesn't. But I, overall, I just think the hard work and the honesty of being original and having my own style and being, being great with the fans. I love that the fans love what we do 
and find it intriguing. You know, I just think it's amazing. You know, I, I love it to this day still. Joey, you're a good man. Everything you touched on are, to me, are incredible ideals. Uh, they're like uh, things that I would put on on the wall saying, I want to be that, 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 and that. And I try to be all those things you just said. And I, I just love it. You said it perfectly. And so I think that's a great, perfect spot to stop because you just kind of summed up some great human uh, qualities that I, I respect so much. So, man, dude, well, the, the only thing that we, we got to do, somehow we got to record together, do something together where it's double drums, you're singing, we'll figure it out at some point. But that, I, we got to do that. We're both together <laughs> on a cut that's going to come sometime. Oh, yeah. Yeah. On that album, it's, isn't that album coming out? Isn't it out right now or about not, to come out? It's not out yet. No, I was told to fall. Are we allowed to talk about it? What do you think? I, I don't. I, you know, I leave it alone because yeah. they've actually, well, there is press on Blabbermouth about the actual record with people like myself and Sebastian and uh, 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 Na is it Nancy Wilson, I think, is going to be a. Uh, well, the thing is, everybody listening, this is a, a tribute record to an incredible band. I guess we won't say who they are, but they had a lot of hits. It was a trio. That's all we'll say. But uh, me and Joey are on it, but we didn't play together. Right. There you go. I think, we, I, think I did four cuts, and they had somebody sing in the parts, and then they would send them out, because this was during the pandemic. I would have loved to sing. I mean, I, if they needed me to do anything, I would have done... A lot of that, man. I, I still do a bunch of Triumph right now. I mean, I got, I got. Ah, you said it. <laughs> oh, that's all. Right. It's out there. It's out there. That's out there. I, I yeah. saw it. I saw it on Blair Month. Everybody. That part is out there. It's just, they haven't really said when they're going to release it. They didn't give you titles of songs. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm really excited because we do. I'm glad. I'm, I hold it highly that you're on the, the cut. And it was nice to be able to hear you in the cans playing and uh but by the way i would love to do something musically as a front guy while you're playing and some of these events that you do uh i got one for you i'm gonna i won't say right now but i'm gonna i'm gonna run it by somebody and uh you know i'm a big fan of yours as a person first and then i love to love that you you play every style of music and i want everybody to know that that doesn't know that that only knows you from anthrax so anyway joey man you rock dude i gotta get on with uh doing a whole bunch of other things today casey good to see you stick your lovely face in there bye Thank you, bye hi kenny look at that all right you guys take care man and i'll i'll stay in touch and keep Love growing you. that corn man thank bye. you for the opportunity man, all right, man. see you brother <laughs> see you bye see you bye, bye. bye.